I want to just uh, now ask to come to uh, the microphone uh, the Vice Chairman of Enterprise Florida. Is that a perfect thing for today and the enterprise we're about to do? Um, the Vice Chairman is Mr. Alan Becker, the founding partner of, oddly enough, Becker and Polyakov. Please welcome, come on up, Alan. Thank you. Well, thank you, Margaret. Uh, it's great to be here with you. I think we know each other 40 years, and uh, I know. And well, we were children, and, and yeah. So nice to see. My first boss was Judge Grossman uh, <laughs> back in uh, 1970 or something like that. And of course, known Nikki a long time. Um, I was a child. They were older. Um, so I have uh, the privilege to read a letter that the governor asked me to read. The governor is the chairman of Enterprise Florida, and um, I have the privilege to be the vice chairman, so I'm gonna exercise some of that privilege to shorten the letter he wrote, and um, <laughs> only read some of it, uh, and summarize the rest. It starts, as governor, I want to thank uh, Port Everglades, the Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau, and the Port Everglades Association for your work to grow Florida's economy. Together, we are in a mission to make Florida the number one place for, in the world for business growth and job creation. And then he goes on to say how we're going to hit 100 million visitors this year, uh, that, we're going to inv that we have invested $850 million in our ports and we'll do even more. And then he concludes, thank you for hosting visitors from around the world. As the gateway to Latin America and beyond, our state offers many advantages as a global hub for business. Together, we are helping make Florida the very best place in the world to raise a family, get a good paying job, and build a great life. And so uh, now I will return to that great life and have lunch with all of you. And on behalf of the governor and Enterprise Florida, keep up the great work. Thank you, Mary. It was about that 40-year mark that uh, he saved me from a 99-year rec lease. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you haven't been here very long. Now it's my pleasure to uh, call to your attention and welcome and recognize the elected officials who are with us today. Commissioner Chip Lamarca, somewhere in Beyond the Lights. Thank you, Commissioner. And Commissioner Beam Fur, somewhere Beyond the Lights over here. Thank you, Beam. Is Commissioner Lois Wexler here yet? Yes, you are. Hello, Lois. Welcome. We are very grateful that you are here from the County Commission. Um, Hollywood Mayor Peter Bober. Uh, Hollywood Vice Mayor Kevin Biederman. Hollywood Commissioner Patricia Asaf. Commissioner Dick Blattner. And Commissioner Linda Sherwood. Please welcome the City of Hollywood. And if there's a commissioner here whom I didn't mention, jump up and yell it now. Okay, last chance. Uh, Dania Beach Mayor Marco Salvino Sr., which where are you guys? And Commissioner Albert Jones and Commissioner Walter Duke. Thank you so much for the support from the city of Dania Beach. City of Fort Lauderdale, uh, soon to join us, we hope, Jack. Mayor Jack Seiler and Vice Mayor Romney Rogers. I'd also like to welcome former Senator Steve Geller, uh, retired Judge Mel Grossman, sitting somewhere here, former Senator Ken Jenny, former Commissioner John Hart, and I just want to take a minute to thank my friend Rosemary O'Hara, editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel for being here with us today. Thank you everybody. I sincerely hope I have not missed anyone who is an office holder or former, a former office holder. Is Senator Rich here? I did, then I missed her because I didn't. Senator Nan Rich, see you get a special. Okay. The lights are blinding here on Broadway. Um, now I'd like to welcome to the microphone and for all of you to uh, introduce you to the chairman of this luncheon, the economic engine Performance Report Luncheon Committee Chair, 
Mr. Brian Nunez from Ranger Technical Resources. Good morning. Thank you everyone for coming out this morning. And I just want to take a second and thank all of our sponsors here today for coming on and being table hosts. And also do a special recognition to our reception sponsors. Uh, Burjohn Land Development, City of Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport, and Keith Associates Consulting. I'd um, also like to take a second to thank our premium sponsor, uh, Kim, AECOM, Kimco, and Seabulk. And at this time, I would love to have Lori Bear come up and talk a little bit about AECOM. No, I don't know who that laughing hyena on the screen was, but I'm Lori Baer, and I'm the National Ports and Marine Lead for AECOM. And along with my aviation colleague, Jim Pantina, we're so pleased to be participating in today's Port Everglades Association Economic Engines event. AECOM recently merged with another global powerhouse, URS, now we are 100,000 strong in more than 100 countries around the world. AECOM is a $19 billion company, and we do airport and seaport work all over the world. But please hear me on this. We are proud of nothing more than the privilege that we have been given to do work for Broward's airport and seaport. Last month, Fortune Magazine named AECOM as the most admired company in the world, and our goal only is to continue to earn the admiration of those we serve. I have a short 90-second specially produced video. I hope you'll honor us and give it a good watch. I'd like to thank AECOM and Lori Bear again and present her with this Economic Engine Award. Thank you. Next up, can we have Peter Flint from Kimco? Good morning. My name is Pete Flint. I represent Kimco Realty. Kimco is the largest community shopping center REIT in the United States. We are proud to introduce our newly planned mixed use development to this state of the port event. This 100-acre assemblage is the culmination of a seven-year effort by Kimco's partners, Terry Saltzman and Bob Shapiro. Dania Point is only two miles south of the Fort Lauderdale Airport and approximately four miles from the Port Everglades. This is probably the biggest parcel of commercial land hiding in plain sight in eastern Broward County. The Dania Point project will serve a trade area of over 1.1 million people and has 270,000 cars a day passing by on I-95. We will have more than 1,600 feet of visibility along the interstate, providing convenient access for residents, visitors, shoppers, hotel guests, and major corporate users.
The point will include a regional open air community center on the southern third of the property and a mixed use lifestyle center on the northern two thirds. The Main Street retail will be accessible to the future residents, hotel guests, and office users, all of whom will be able to walk out their doors and be part of this dynamic and vibrant complex. Community gathering spaces, entertainment venues, and street level retail will provide a true live, work, play, and stay destination. When completed, Dania Point will be the largest open air center in eastern Broward County. The view into the center from I-95 will showcase the pedestrian friendly Main Street retail leading to mid-rise luxury apartments, twin hotels, and several office towers. A contemporary design scheme will embrace the South Florida style, providing a clean, cool look and an attractive design for our tenants, guests, and residents. Energy efficient LED lighting, water features, and lush landscaping will enhance the visitor's experience and keep them coming back to Dania Point over and over again. Wide boulevards with landscape medians, convenient parking, and generous sidewalks will welcome guests to stroll along the main street and mingle with neighbors, visitors, and local residents, all while browsing through over 70 shops, more than a dozen restaurants, and several entertainment venues. The dramatic sight lines will encourage visitors to explore the depth of offerings here at Dania Point. Comfortable stops along the main street will allow for conversation, relaxation, or just staying connected. Wide si sidewalks allow for gatherings of family and friends, outdoor restaurant seating, or simply meeting new people. The vertical destinations punctuate the horizontal views, providing inviting destinations for both visitors and locals alike. The shops at Dania Point will provide up to one million square feet of retail and restaurant uses. The residences at Dania Point will provide 1,000 luxury apartments. An additional 300 hotel rooms will complement the four existing hotels on the south side of Dania Point. The offices at Dania Point will eventually accommodate up to 750,000 square feet of corporate and medical offices in several planned towers. We are committed to creating the largest and highest quality mixed use development in Eastern Broward County over the next several years. We are hoping our project will be a catalyst for the improvement of not only Dania Beach, but also Eastern Broward County. We believe that Dania Point will be a significant addition and an economic stimulus to the area and will not only become an amenity to the port, but it will also create a destination venue for the tens of millions of airport visitors and the over 4 million cruise ship passengers of Port Everglades. We look forward to working with port officials over the next few years to help each other market our respective facilities. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today and thank you all for coming to this event. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Kim Coe. And last but not least, I'd like to present our last uh, premium sponsor, Tony Caggiano from Seabulk. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tony Caggiano, the, operation, or the marketing manager for Seabulk Towing uh, here in Port Everglades. Um, uh, Seabulk Towing is a proud member of the Seacor Holdings family of companies. We operate uh, six ports from Port Arthur to Port Canaveral and in between Mobile, Lake Charles, uh, Tampa, and obviously Port Everglades. Uh, we currently operate uh, the most uh, up-to-date tractor fleet within the, these regions, and uh, we look forward to uh, updating that fleet throughout the, uh, the Gulf and the Atlantic Coast. Uh Seabulk Towing, based in Port Everglades, is a leading tugboat fleet with operations along the Gulf Coast and southeastern seaboard port system. Seabulk Towing is a recognized leader in innovation and service and a proud member of the Seacor Holdings family of companies. With its fleet of modern tractor and conventional tugs, Seabulk Towing offers the experience and flexibility to meet the requirements of the most demanding projects. If it's muscle that's needed, Seabulk Towing has managed vessels exceeding 1,000 feet in length, including some of the largest ships in the U.S. Navy fleet. If it's reliability you have in mind, Seabulk workhorses average 17,000 towing assists per year. And if staying power is important, the latest additions to the Seabulk fleet, the Athena, Apollo, 
Atlas and Aura are twin-screw ASD 60-ton bollard tugs designed to meet the increased demands of worldwide shipping. Seasoned mariners with years of experience in the industry man the Seabulk fleet. These professionals are backed by a corporate philosophy and a management team committed not only to safe and environmentally conscious practices, but also keenly focused on meeting the needs and demands of a diverse marketplace. Um, I'm also the president of the Port Everglades Association. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody today and take a moment to recognize the organizers of today's event, Margaret Kempel, Brian Nunez, who you just met, Keith Hart, Celeste Davis, and Forrest Grantham. And if I miss somebody, oh, please applause. And if there's somebody I missed, please accept my apology and thanks. That's an excellent job done by everyone. Uh, the Port Everglades mission statement, so eloquently drafted in 1979, by the late Gene Fitzgerald, states the association serves as a bridge between the public and private interests to facilitate Port Everglades achieving its rightful place in the first rank of America's ports of ocean commerce. When he drafted this statement, Port Everglades was primarily a petroleum terminal. Mr. Fitzgerald and his five fellow founders encouraged the active involvement of the port business community to advance the growth of the seaport to benefit the community at large. 36 years later, I am proud to have been elected Port Everglades Association President and to serve in an executive capacity with Vice President Rich Vogel of South Florida Petroleum Services, past President Ray Jones of FEC, Treasurer Phil McNally, Golf Tournament Chair Fred Regacki of International Warehouse Services, Security Issues Chair Ed Alfred of Crowley, and Economic, I'm sorry, and Membership Chair Keith Hart of Cotswold Ventures, and Economic Engine Chair Luncheon of Brian New guests from uh, Ranger Technical Resources. In the past few years, the association has been joined in its mission by the Broward Workshop, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance, and the Chamber of Commerce from Fort Lauderdale, Dania Beach, and Hollywood, the tri-city area in which the port, the airport, and the convention center sit. The targeted assistance from these business organizations moves us closer to our place in the first rank envisioned by Gene Fitzgerald. And as President, as, as, sorry, as Port Everglades achieves, so too will Broward County achieve its place in the first rank of counties and American metropolitan regions. The association thanks Broward County for, for allowing, the, allowing and helping us present today's reports from its enterprise fund managers, the drivers of the economy in greater Broward County, Florida. Now, please welcome to the stage the moderator of today's economic engine performance reports, Mr. Phil Allen. <laughs> Phil Allen retired as Chief Executive Port Director of Port Everglades in April of 2012. He first joined Broward County in 1986 as Chief Financial Officer after serving in similar capacities for Cleveland and Akron, Ohio. While directing the port, he gained County Commission approval of the port's 20-year master plan. The plan, which continues to provide a guide for infrastructure, development, and management practices, places Port Everglades in the forefront of leading worldwide seaports for cruise and cargo operations, as well as development of the South Florida region. While at the port, he served as chair of the, Fort of the Florida Seaport Trade and Economic Development Commission, as well as chair of the Florida, Florida Ports Council. As county CFO, he was actively involved in assisting of assisting the airport, convention, and visitor bureau in the development of their master plan, master and financial plans. He had also served briefly as interim Broward County Administrator. Please welcome Phil Allen. Good job. Thank you, Tony. Good afternoon, all. Six years ago, Margaret Kempel and I were discussing ways to engage the community better in engage the community in the value and impact of the port to the economy of Broward County. We hit on the idea of a concept of this economic engines conference to also highlight the impact of our airport and convention visitors bureau. From that time to today's event, we have witnessed a growing support for these efforts. This year, the conference committee decided to alter the presentation a little bit to, to a more of a moderated panel discussion. 
The committee cast its efforts to find a moderator for the panel. Regrettably, Chuck Dodd, Bob Schieffer, and Chris Wallace were not available or within Margaret's budget. However, when I offered to moderate for the price of a dinner roll and a glass of iced tea, the committee selected me. I guess when you're retired, you become very cheap. Seriously, they could have saved the role since I am so honored to share the podium with this panel of Nikki Grossman, Kent George, and Steve Cernak. At your table, you have their bios that testify to the experience these individuals bring to Broward. I, however, would merely point out that collectively, these panel members are the spark plugs that make the county's economic engine roar. While our Board of County Commissioners set the policies, it is these three people along with their staffs that is the reason we lead the state in the recovery from the last recession. More importantly, they are also my former colleagues, friends, and in the case of Steve, a worthy competitor. Join me in welcoming them to the podium. <laughs> Is the mic on now? Okay, good, great. Wait, is mine? Yeah, they're all on. Okay. Better watch what you say. I am. Although they will turn it off if I ask them to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, they won't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start off, Kent. Uh, please take a few minutes to tell us about your recent accomplishments of your organization and the record-breaking year, the record-breaking year you have experienced at Fort Lauderdale International. Over the last year, we've had an extreme amount of success at the airport. Uh, traffic is up. We hit an all-time record of about 24.5 million passengers, up from about 23.5 the year before. And believe it or not, next year we're going to hit between 25.5 and, and 26 million passengers out of the airport. That's significant for a community in Broward County of about 1.7 million in the entire uh, region, about 6 million. We've uh, grown considerably also in international. We are right now the fastest growing international airport in the country, and we have been that way for about the last 13 months. What a lot of people have a hard time understanding is the, the amount of O&D traffic, origination and destination traffic from our community that Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport handles. But until you use the airport and you find out how easy it is to get in and get out and how simple and convenient it is, you then realize why we are the leader in this area. We have about 54, 55 percent of the total traffic in and out of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport is OND. Of our total traffic, about 90 some percent, 94 in that area, is also uh, OND traffic. The rest is connecting. And we're going to talk some more about the connecting in just a second. Um, with the airport expansion, the county commission had one of the successes of the entire state, if not the country, in putting this together. This is a South Rumway project. That's what it looked like when it just started three and a half years ago. This project generated, at its peak, a million dollars a day in spending. And that's what we have with the new South Rumway, which opened on time and on budget on September 18th, 2014. Folks, <clears throat> the commission made sure that that kept going, but I want to tell you, it was a huge, huge effort, not only by the contractors and the other folks involved, but also by the users of the airport, because there's a lot of inconvenience. I'm going to give you a figure. In 2013, over Thanksgiving, we had about 600 to 650 uh, arrivals and departures that day. We averaged 18-minute delays that day. We were running one runway, running the whole operation. It was just very, very difficult. 
the way the control tower handled it and the recognition by the FAA, our control tower was recognized as the control tower of the year for the entire United States with the way they operated with, off of one runway. We fast forward to this uh, 2014 Thanksgiving. We've had 700 to 750 flights in one day, and we had only one delay that was attributed to airspace out of JFK Airport. Not one delay out of that airport. So that, very, very significant, very significant. As we go forward, you'll see on here a number of things that we're gonna be doing with the terminals. Every single terminal is under construction. Now, that's about $1.3 billion more worth of work. Terminal one, we're putting a new five gate addition called Concourse A. Those gates will all be international gates, those new five gates, and they'll be swing gates. They can operate domestic to international, international to domestic. That's going to be significant for the work that needs to be done as we go into the future with U.S. Customs. Again, we are growing leaps and bounds. We expect in the next three years to um, double what we're doing today. The entire terminal is going to be redone. Terminal 2, the same thing. <clears throat> You've seen some of the work with the changing of the security checkpoints, getting concessions to post security. I want to point out to everybody again, those terminals, 2, 3, and 4, were built and opened in 1985, and Terminal 1 was opened in the year 2000. They're all pre-9-11. They weren't set up for the security and the operations that we have now, and they are in the process. Terminal 3, as you know, we've got the two security checkpoints. Las Olas has turned into a cross um, area that uh, is now post-security, works very much um, <clears throat> uh, customer-oriented. Terminal 4 is a complete rebuild. Terminal 4 will have 14 gates. They only have 10 today. As we speak right now, the bids are out for the eastern remaining eight gates and those uh, will be opened in the fall of 2017. So that'll be a new 14 gate swing gate terminal with 12 of those gates swing gates. Go ahead and run the uh, expansion. As you go through there. That's where we are today. That's some inside of it. And then, of course, our economic impact of $3.9 billion in wages and $13.2 billion total overall. That's a quick overview. Look forward to any questions you have. Phil, you got it back. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Nikki, you're Sorry. up. Tell us about your year. First of all, I have one thing I have to do. Um, if anybody wants a three-story, three-bedroom, three three-and-a-half bath, Fabulous townhouse house on the Intercoastal in Hollywood, just north of Sheridan Street. Please call me. Um, we are entering a new phase of our lives, and it's a wonderful place to live. You see dolphins, manatees, everything else. And I know there's a fine I have to pay for doing this, yes. probably completely illegal, but I would love to hear from you. <laughs> my cell phone, oh, thank you. And now my husband can relax. I've done what I came here to do. Next is to tell you what a, a real honor and privilege it is to be back here again um, with my colleagues in what's called the Economic Engines of Broward County. But I have to tell you truthfully um, that the Economic Engine of Broward County resides on the fourth floor of the Governmental Center. There is very little that any of us can do um, without encouragement, um, without support, and without direction of the mayor and the Board of County Commissioners. And I know they were introduced by Margaret and it doesn't, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense for you to again meet those members of the Board of County Commissioners who are here um, and who actually hear from you, see you, understand what you're doing here, um, and will listen to you when you have a matter of important business and urgency to discuss with them. So I, and I know that Commissioner Beamfer is here. Stand up. Now this time really, stand up so that they can understand that you took time out of your day to be here and hear from them. 
I know that Commissioner Chip Lamarca is here. <laughs> to build a hotel, I'm in. I'm all in. Um, I know that uh, the chair of our Tourist Development Council and County Commissioner Lois Wexler is here. And I know I'm in deep stuff. If, I, if there's any other county commissioners that I didn't see when you walked in, is there anyone else here? Don't yell at me, please. Yes? No? Yes. Okay. So it takes a couple of things to do what this destination has done over the past several years. 20, let's go back 20 years. It takes leadership. We just discussed the leadership years because we are very much dependent on each other and very much dependent on um, the job that we do to help and secure the, the important numbers and growth that, that each of us is doing. And as a matter of fact, I am pleased to announce um, that a very large uh, conference that was called shipping My Cruise Shipping Miami um, for several years in Miami. Um, as a matter of fact, starting in 2016, will be called Sea Trade Global Cruise Conference held here at the Greater Fort Lauderdale Broward County Convention Center. You've been looking at my numbers, um, record-breaking hotel occupancy. I will tell you that for the year 2014, that number was almost 78%, and that's annual occupancy. That's in February when you feel like everybody's here, and in August when you feel like nobody's here. You put that, those months together, and the rest of the year we were at 77.8, an absolute record-breaking number of occupancy, especially when you consider that almost 2,000 new hotel rooms have been added to the inventory over the past two years. So it's a really big deal. But then go back and look at the fact that it's the first time in history that Greater Fort Lauderdale, that Broward County, was at the list, the top of the list of occupancy in the state of Florida. Sorry, Mickey Mouse. Sorry, Key West. Sorry, Miami Beach. Sorry, South Beach. Sorry, Keys. Sorry, not sorry at all. Um, but. It is, it tells the story of Broward County. We're 100 years old, very important celebration this year, as you saw when you met all the fine characters that came walking through here. It's, it's a big deal. It's a community that's not afraid to reinvent itself every once in a while when it has to, and it continues to elevate itself. And that's, that's what makes us different and sets us apart from virtually any other destination really honestly in the world. Other countries, when they reinvent themselves, it's because they had a war. We reinvent ourselves because we are a community that cares about elevating all segments of the community, everybody, every part, and, and that's what makes us a great place to live, to visit, to work, and to play. We had the best January and February that we have ever had in the history of Broward County. And February's occupancy, you see that occupancy for 2014 was 77.8. Uh, February's occupancy for Broward County was 94.3%. That means if you needed a hotel, you could have come stayed at my townhouse on the intercoastal in Hollywood. <laughs> Did I not say it was in Hollywood? I'm so sorry. It's just north of Sheridan Street. Um, but anyway. Um, <laughs> But you get that kind of occupancy and you get that kind of excitement and enthusiasm when you're able to work with the airport, you're able to work with the seaport, and you're able to deliver to this destination 14.3 million visitors. The things that we have in this community are nice for us to enjoy us 1.8 million folks, but they're here because they also service almost 15 million visitors. Alan Becker told you the governor says we're going to have 100 million visitors um, in the state of Florida next, by 20, what did he say, 2020? This year. Oh, even better, because we're going to deliver 15 million visitors to the governor um, at the end of 2015. That's going to be our contribution to the governor's 100 million visitors. What's important to hoteliers is the next number that follows, and that is $129. Um, average daily rate, which is what they pay to have this, and it's, a, it's still a great value and it's a good deal. 
Um, we also had um, a record-breaking number of tourist development tax dollars collected. That's money that you only pay if you're staying in a hotel, motel, or other facility for less than six months during a year. Um, and that um, tourist tax dollars we collected in 2014 was $53 million. God, I hate saying that because people are listening. and I, It's very important promotional money, $53 million. That collection was up 12% over the year before. The economic impact of all of this on all of us was $11.4 billion in visitor spending. Not what we spent when we took our cousins out when they came to visit us, but what they spent when they got to this destination. Every time 85 people make a decision to visit this community, to come to Broward County, one job is generated in the hospitality industry. And almost 25% of our population is somehow employed in the hospitality industry. So that number is very, very important, and it's important it keeps growing. More than $222 million was reinvested in the destination um, in improvements and renovations at more than 10 hotels. New investment, more than $704 million in new hotel developments, including a Fort Lauderdale Conrad, a Fort Lauderdale Four Seasons, a Hollywood Margaritaville, several other limited service hotels that are going to be servicing our um, airport and seaport customers as they come through here. And you got to understand that that means jobs, that means money in your business. And if you don't think your business is impacted by tourism, think back to 2001 and what happened to your business when they didn't come. We are on target now to hit over a million room nights to be sold in group bookings. And these are the people that come for conferences and conventions. Other 2014 highlights, which you could actually read, although it's kind of small, I'll do this really quick. Uh, we grew international visitation by almost 30%, um, particularly from Brazil and Scandinavia. But as each one of these opportunities opens up, and because, again, of the impact and the, um, the direction of the county commission saying, we want to see some international activity, well, you better learn some new languages because that international activity is here. They're arriving daily, and they're arriving in record numbers. We opened this year with something that we call 40 Days of Love and Warmth. And as soon as that was over, we took a look around and we said, 80s? I mean, really, in the middle of winter, it's going to be 80s? And we looked at Chicago, and we looked at Boston, and created a program called Warm Up Chicago and Warm Up Boston. I, I just want to, again, tell you what an honor it is to be part of this machine, this engine um, that, that uh, is so appreciated by your industry. And we thank you, the three of us, and Phil. Phil likes it because he gets to go out of the house and come out and do something and puts on his... I remember that suit from when he worked for the county, but... Um, and you know what? And the tie, fit. too. The tie. It does still fit. That's, that's amazing. Uh, you said you were going to lose weight, but I guess it just, you know, didn't matter. You're fine. You look good. Uh, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your loyalty to this community. And my message, as it always is, when you see somebody who's a visitor and you'll know them somehow, Please wave to them, show them your hospitality, and wave with all five fingers of your hand. Thank you very much.
take a look and see if there's anything on your sunglasses. You're a winner! You are Fort Lauderdale! You're coming here. Get out of town! <laughs> you just won a free vacation to Greater Fort Lauderdale. So excited. Christine, guess what? What? You're going to Fort Lauderdale today. No way! Oh my God. Steve, it's your turn if you can follow that. Oh, of course he can. So back to follow. <laughs> well, Nikki, that's a tough act to follow. Afternoon, everybody. As you can see, 2014 was a record year at Port Everglades. The increase in activity has had a corresponding increase in economic benefits. We're still in the process of reviewing the data from fiscal year 2014. However, I'm happy to report that our preliminary economic impact numbers show approximately a 10% growth in both the number of jobs and economic activity. More than 220,000 jobs in Florida are in some way related to the cargo and cruise activity of Port Everglades. The, the fiscal year 2014 in cargo and cruise activity of Port Everglades generated $28.3 billion in economic value to the state of Florida. I want you to note that on your seats are copy of, copies of our new hot off the press commerce reports with more details about the port's achievements and statistics. McIntosh Road was reconfigured into a loop road for better traffic flow for the container trucks. This project supported approximately 130 construction jobs. The, this new rail facility is already proving to be a successful asset for the port. It supported more than 700 construction jobs and is helping us increase our cargo numbers so that more permanent jobs can be created. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have had the pleasure over the past three years to drive in over Eller Drive, but I'm sure that many of you are enjoying the ease that we now have getting in and out of the port since the Eller Drive overpass opened and was completed yeah. earlier this year. We have to continually update and modernize our cruise facilities because our guests expect a positive experience when they vacation from South Florida. To further enhance this experience, we partner with the Broward County Cultural Division to bring artwork into our terminals. Cruise Terminal 4, the most recent uh, upgrade, um, will be getting two new art pieces. One's entitled Pelican Path by Xavier Cortada and there will be some glass artwork installed by Dale Chihuly. The Upland Mangrove Enhancement is a project that we developed in cooperation with the South Florida Audubon Society. Once the mangroves that are planted trend for success for one full year, we will be able then to lengthen the Southport turning notch to add up to five new cargo berths. Now I'm going to spend a little more time on this one. Uh, this is something that's been near and dear to my heart. And um, I want to thank uh, all of our elected officials uh, that have supported the project. It started with the passing of the WERDA bill by Congress. The manager's amendment contained a provision that would allow the port to advance fund the project or portions as appropriate to keep the project moving forward rather than face additional delays while we were waiting for the federal funding through their budgeting process. After the, pro the concept here is after the project is authorized by Congress in a subsequent, subsequent word of bill, we would get credit for the advanced funding that we provided against our cost share component of the project. There has been significant pro progress on this project over the past year. On February 27th, the Civil Works Review Board um, was held in Washington, D.C., and they unanimously authorized the project to move forward. So after almost 19 years, the word draft was finally removed from the chief's report. <laughs> the report's currently in the public uh, review and comment period, and a signed report is expected in early June. Now, there are many people in this room who helped the port in moving this pr critical project forward. Certainly there's the support of the county commission, and that was critical. So from port staff, uh, 
I'd like to thank the three commissioners who are present personally for their efforts in supporting us. Our federal and state legislators also work tirelessly in a very remarkably bipartisan way. Um, the governor's office provided critical support when needed. Congresswomen Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Lois Frankel and their staff really provided the extra push when it was needed. The remainder of the Florida delegation were unanimous in their support. The Port Everglades Association, Port Everglades Action Team, Port Everglades Pilots, the ILA, and the other Longshoremen Union, shipping lines, terminal operators, other port stakeholders, Port Everglades staff, and many others all worked together to make this happen. There may be some others that I've overlooked, but the point here is that we all came together to help move this project forward. But, but I must caution everyone, this is only the beginning of a lengthy process to get this project constructed. But I thank you all for your help. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, let's start off, Nikki. Uh, there's a rumor out there that you may be looking to build the uh, new hotel here at the convention center. Uh, please tell us or describe to us how it's going to be different than the last three proposals. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you just can't do something four times and not get it right. And, and I think that um, what's really exciting is at this time at its goals workshop um, last year, the Board of County Commissioners um, virtually unanimously mentioned a uh, convention center hotel, uh, headquarters hotel, and an expansion of the convention center as one of the top goals for um, economic development for Broward County. Uh, we are hoping um, that uh, we will be able to encourage developers to look at this project. Um, we are certainly marketing it in a smarter way than we have ever done before. Um, we are going um, step by step, almost tediously, but for all the right reasons, um, through a uh, process that will bring us a developer, that will ultimately bring a development team that will include a uh, franchise or a flag, um, and the board has a couple of big time decisions to make in, in, in the next little while in order to get this project opened and built. Um, there has to be a decision uh, made as to whether or not there's going to be any public funding put into the project or whether that's going to be required. A uh, decision has to be made on the size. At the moment, we're talking about a 750-room hotel and about a 100,000-square-foot expansion um, of the convention center. Um, and, and a price tag is going to have to, to be determined at some point. There's a wide net being cast for um, interest by developers and by flags and by teams. Um, we are very enthusiastic, very excited. This is, a, this is a decent site. This entire site is a decent site to place this um, headquarters hotel and to do the expansion of the convention center. There is one million, there are one million room nights that we're missing each year because we can't go through the RFP process to get group business into the destination because we can't answer yes, we have a headquarters hotel. Um, that translates again into jobs, into money, into your pocket, and we are, you know, I, I usually, oh, this is wood, right? So the bottom line is it looks like we are moving forward, that we are of one mind in the community. The hotel community is supportive. Um, the business community um, came forth actually early in this process and said time to, to do this to bring new business. So. That's what's different, um, I, I, and, and, and I think the fact that you can't ignore the potential business um, now, that business um, opportunity has grown so much that they, they just can't, no one can ignore that any longer. Nikki, you've described the, uh, the need for a headquarters hotel. Does that translate into what uh, you've or told me about in the past relative to a room block commitment, that that is drives the nature of potentially public funding? It, well, it does, it does two things. It secures rooms at the hotel for the purpose that this hotel is going to be built. It isn't going to be built as another resort-type hotel on 17th Street with no obligation um, to be a business generator for the convention center and the convention business of Broward County. So a room block agreement, and all that is is that um, the hotel operator agrees to work with the county through the Convention and Visitors Bureau to determine how many rooms, how many times a year 
those rooms would be available for the CVB to sell um, outward of I mean, you could sell out 20 years. We're selling into 2022 right now, but um, uh, 24 months out from the date, and the hotel can sell 24 months in from the date, and anything that the CVB doesn't sell out, the hotel gets back to sell at whatever rate they choose. It's negotiated rate, so it does translate potentially into what kind of public support might be required to get the project built. Thank you. Uh, Related to the hotel, Steve, uh, the master plan for the hotel, the convention center expansion, includes Terminal 1, which currently is a cruise terminal that supports about 200,000 passenger movements a year. That would be converted into oh, use for the guy. hotel. Uh, what was that, Nikki? I said you're such a port guy. Oh, well. uh, Steve, do you have a way to handle that business elsewhere in the port? Well, certainly. That it's a challenge in that when we look forward as to how we grow the business and manage the business, if you're removing a facility from the portfolio, of course it becomes a challenge. Uh, it's going to be up to us to find the facility that we can substitute to preserve that line of business. Uh, we're trying to fit in with the bigger picture of what is best for the community at large. So if I look, certainly if I look at it from a port perspective, yes, there's challenges, but we feel we can overcome them. But the bigger picture shows that the com community will benefit more from the removal of Terminal 1 from the portfolio um, without getting into specifics of locations because there's a moving target. We have a few ideas that we're exploring, but we intend to preserve the business. Nick, I think area. the original proposal for the hotel had a joint use facility for Terminal 1. Is that still a possibility? I, I, don't, I don't think so because of the nature of what the new construction project is. is the, the Commission um, has kind of indicated that they want this not to simply be a convention center hotel and expansion of the convention center. They want this to become a destination uh, within the destination. And the uses of virtually all of the site now um, are um, kind of relegated to um, those purposes. Uh, the master plan, at, you know, and I, I, I probably, we're not arguing over this, and I, truly we're not, but the master plan acknowledges that the Terminal 1 would be available for um, hotel and uh, convention center expansion. So, uh, and, and we will work closely with the port, like we always do, to make sure that whatever alternative comes up is something that we um, will help to encourage and, and uh, keep, keep them busy. Thank you. Uh, Kent, uh, a, few, a few years ago, you and your predecessors described uh, Fort Lauderdale International as the domestic marketplace for South Florida. With the growth in international travel that we've seen, do you expect that side of the business to be growing more than domestic uh, going forward? Well, both ways. Um, the, the, the whole community is in an enviable position. Recently, uh, JetBlue announced JetBlue 100. Uh, they were previously doing about 40 flights a day. They're up to about 60 to 70 flights a day. And within the next 18 months to two years, there'll be over 100 flights a day. Southwest has turned around and is investing in and making sure Concourse A is done by 2017, with all five of those gates, the new gates, being international. And they do about 50 to 60 flights a day. And we believe that they will be closer on a slower growth pattern, but closer to 80 flights by about 2018 and going further. One of the other interesting things is, is that uh, our hometown carrier, Spirit Airlines, who has done a tremendous job out here in providing service both domestically and internationally, has filled a niche that, that provides value uh, flying, is what I think Ben calls it, Ben Baldanza. <clears throat> it's lower cost, but they're going to receive 50-some aircraft in the next couple of years. And I would venture to say that they're going to be looking at plus 100 flights a day sometime in the future. Now, you put that together, 
with both domestic and international, and with the number of seats that we have that are already booked through this fall to come through Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, we're running 90 plus percent load factor on every single airplane out of here, both domestic and international. And we're projecting that we are going to continue to grow between 20 and 30 percent a month, and that's over last year's 20 to 25 percent growth as we go into the future. And that's why the commission, the county commission, has looked at this and said, we have to get these facilities built to meet the demand of the community. Now, it's ironic, Phil, that we, as you know, when, when, with, the, with the port, <clears throat> we work with Nikki in our marketing dollars. We really didn't do a big, strong effort in marketing on international. The carriers came to us. We go to domestically 49 of our top 50 markets. And we have had growth again in the international area of between 25 and 35 percent. And we see this going on for the, at least the next year to two years. And the, the, the tea leaves show that the carriers are going to back it up. And I haven't even talked about the major carriers that have uh, shown some kind of growth that they're doing. Thank you. Do you see any growth in the cargo side? <clears throat> cargo, um, we have a very, very good uh, compatible airport to the south of us, and that's Miami. They are a hub for American Airlines, which is now combined with U.S. Airways, and they do about 74, 75 percent of the traffic at Miami. But Miami is a huge, huge cargo airport and very huge for perishable goods. And uh, I foresee that there will be some increase in cargo. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going on a, a um, update of our master plan. I think we'll have some facilities that'll be available for additional cargo. But if you look at FedEx and UPS, they have tremendous facilities at Miami that were built years ago. And to reinvest in, in something this large, even though it makes more sense with the accessibility we have, um, the long range capability of our airport with a 9,000 foot runway restricts some of the large international uh, flights that they want to be able to accomplish going south into um, uh, central, but more so into south and lower South America. So I think you'll see some cargo grow, growth, but you're not going to see it in the um, uh, significant um, uh, realm of, of what we're seeing in domestic uh, and international passenger growth. Thank you, Ken. Can I just say one thing? Yes. The coolest thing about the airport, has anybody been on US-1 when one of those planes landed or took off right over your head? <laughs> has anybody? Really seriously? No one? Get in your car, get on US-1, go back and forth a few times until you see it. You, you, it can't really happen in real life, but it happens how many times a day? <coughs> 50 times a day. About 20% uh, uh, of our operations, the 30% of our operations happen on the south runway now. Steve, uh, a, few years, a, a few years ago, a certain former port director uh, boldly predicted that the port, uh, port Everglades would soon overcome Port Miami uh, as the busiest cruise port in the world. What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's always market driven by the various carriers, but um, when I look at the numbers, at least monitoring the numbers recently, I see that there's basically the three, the world's top three cruise ports are all, all in Florida, that being Port Everglades, Port Miami, and uh, Port Canaveral. And I'm looking at the numbers, and on any given day, one may be ahead of the other. We are actually pretty tightly packed towards each other in our numbers. So whether it's one year we're number one or we're number two or three, it keeps moving around. The numbers, the difference between us is you know, incrementally small. It, we view it as a positive for South Florida. 
but you talked about the cruise, uh, did you, uh, but look at our cargo numbers. I, mean, I think that you should really do that. I think really that's that. a big story. I mean, it's a mill. And we, tell we him who's getting the yeah. biggest ship in the world. I mean, who's yeah. getting that? Yeah. You yeah. should really, he's retired. He doesn't he just know doesn't what's going on. He just doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> tell him about the cargo. You well, just don't want to know, we but we're getting team. the biggest ship in the world. Right. I'll get to yeah. that. But well, I'm but I mean, I'm not trying to help numbers. you here, oh, okay? Yeah. We, we cracked a million whiz, TVs guys, for the on, first sell. time last year, <laughs> and it was announced at, at um, Cruise Shipping Miami, the last oh, version of that la uh, last week, that we were going, while um, Oasis of the Seas was going to be leaving Port Everglades and be positioned up at uh, in Canaveral, we would be getting a replacement ship, the, the new Harmony of the Seas, which is about four meters longer <laughs> than Allure. So, so size does matter, it I does guess. It does, absolutely. <laughs> uh, less controversial, perhaps, um, and this is for all three of you. Forgetting politics, what do you see as the opportunities or the threats of a revised policy on Cuba being to your businesses? How can you forget the pol politics? <laughs> well, I can, I can tell you that um, even, even in its present state and over the past 10 years, Cuba has been a draw for a number of visitors um, that were coming to Florida, primarily Canadians, um, who, were, who had the opportunity to do a lower um, cost travel experience and go to Cuba. We heard from tour operators, well, we're going you know, to take them to Cuba. It's, it's a better deal. It's cheaper. And then with, you know, the following year, they were back. It, it, it's going to take Cuba 10 years, at least, in terms of infrastructure growth. Now, the private hoteliers, they're gonna, they'll spend their money and they'll build hotels on the, on the bet. But it's going to take 10 years for the infrastructure there to, to really become a challenge for us, which means we started planning about Cuba five years ago. But at this point, um, it, it, it doesn't... It doesn't hurt us as a destination. In fact, if we do become one of the key gateways to Cuba um, with pre and post visits to Cuba, we'll sell Broward County, Greater Fort Lauderdale, as a uh, pre and, and post Cuba trip. But it's um, it, it, they're, they're they're a little bit. It's a little early to talk about them as a competitor right now. We we, we have for the last couple of years been doing two to three flights a week to uh, Cuba. Um, on a Saturday uh, that is, is chartered out of there. Uh, I see it nothing except a positive thing for the airport, and, and we're ready for it. Um, we have procedures that we've established with U.S. Customs, and uh, we're ready to move forward with it, and I think it's just another boom to the South Florida region that uh, uh, what, what we've been able to do is when demand calls we've been able to step up and be able to provide the supply. And I think we have to be prepared for that, and we've been preparing at the airport for it in, in how we segregate the flights, how we do the clearance, where they go, when they can come in, and so forth. And we work very closely with U.S. Customs. We're prepared, and I think it's a thing that's coming. But if they want us to visit them, they better do something about their human rights policies. Steve? <clears throat> So, you know, clearly in the port sector, it presents an opportunity longer term. But, and yes, the rules and regulations are starting to show signs of loosening, but the fact remains there's still an embargo. It's still controlled by uh, Department of the Treasury uh, licensing. We, the fact does remain, too, that Port Everglades has had weekly service to Cuba for the last 10 years or so with one of the carriers, but that's licensed and it's humanitarian goods, food, and, and, and the like. I think Kent's, uh, you know, his, his word of being prepared and being ready for it, I think that's what we have to start doing. We have to start looking at that. So at the point in time when rules and embargoes and laws change, we're prepared to go in there and be part of that. But uh, the fact still does remain that we are under an embargo, and the, and the recent changes in the rules hasn't changed anything with respect to port operations. Okay. Um, the, Kent, do you have any plans or efforts to separate the luggage from cruise passengers before they get to the airport on their return? 
Is there any opportunities there for the, either the airport or the airlines uh, to separate that luggage so it's not coming through your front door every Saturday and Sunday? Yes. <laughs> Is that something we're likely to see in the near oh, future? okay, okay. <laughs> Um, we have attempted on a number of occasions to be able to try to set something up. We have some uh, areas that we've set up in the terminal buildings to be able to do that. But quite honestly, the, 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 the long pole in the tent has been the desire of the cruise lines to be able to work with us on, on trying to put something together that uh, could be seamless for the passenger. Now that not blaming the cruise lines, they're in business to make money and the airlines are in business to make money. And when the airlines say, sure, I'll take the bags early and I'll work with you, we had something set up, we had a remote security clearing uh, uh, basis and so forth, but it cost the passenger a couple extra bucks. When the passenger comes in and gets the bill from the cruise line for the booze that they bought, they don't have much money left when they sit there and turn around and say, am I gonna spend another 20 or $40 for my bag? It has to be done beforehand, it has to be planned, and it has to be set up that way. And I think um, out of necessity that will happen as we go in the future. However, what we wanna point out that's happened at the airport, and then the airport again has sat back, every single one of the terminals except Terminal 3 is now going to be able to handle inline bags and take bags uh, eight, nine hours in advance, number one. Number two, Terminal 3 will be done in about 12 to 18 months with a new baggage system. Number three, we've turned around and as I spoke about modifying the terminals, being able to open the terminal up and changing security and the concessions to post security so people can eat, can relax, have some place to sit. All these changes are in process being accomplished right now and they're going through construction. In the next 12 to 18 months, it's gonna be all completely new when you walk out there. Terminal one will have 70,000 square feet more of space for concessions and places to be able to sit down. Terminal 2 has about 14,000 extra square feet. Terminal 3, we expand it and be able to connect into Terminal 4. So there'll be lots more flexibility. Yes, I think it's something that should have been done years ago. I wish it was easier to get done, but um, we will continue to work to try to make that, that happen. But we, the, the big thing we've been able to do, though, is open up the the airport earlier for the passenger to be able to check in and get their bags through security. Nikki, uh, community is starting to gather forces for the next Super Bowl. Are, is Broward going to benefit from that? Are you going to fight the good fight on behalf of Broward County? Oh, Broward County will absolutely benefit from it. Um, the last time uh, South Florida went to the NFL for a Super Bowl, well, the last three times we were de denied, um, only the last time because there were a series of new stadiums um, in line ahead of us. But um, the last three proposals were downtown Miami proposals. Um, we have been a financial contributor to the South Florida Super Bowl host committee in the past um, without any um, events or any assignment of Broward hotels to any either the media or teams. We are not likely to be a generous supporter of the Super Bowl host committee, but you bet your ass our hotels are going to make a lot of money and, because we're not going to have to negotiate rates. And you can bet that the businesses in Broward County will benefit and flourish the next time a Super Bowl comes to South Florida. I'm just saying. Steve, uh, sort of wrapping this up here, you mentioned during your presentation about the Corps of Engineers having released the feasibility uh, report for public comment. Can you describe to the audience how they could assist uh, by writing comments either for or against, if you will, but I think more for uh, support of that uh, chief's letter? <laughs> well, the, um, you know, the um, study was published in the Federal Register on the 20th. 
So the 30-day clock started ticking that day. There was, there was a slight delay on one side to the 23rd. There was trouble distributing some of the materials. So technically, at this point, barring any extensions, Everything will be closed down on the 23rd of April. Um, certainly comments in favor of, or if there's anybody that has an objection, certainly those need to be heard too because we want a, a solid package going forward and we want to be able to deal with any issues. So comments are, uh, you know, are encouraged where you feel they're appropriate. It certainly won't hurt the situation. I can tell you. They, go ahead, Ken. I can tell you from the uh, airport side of it with the environmental we did on the runway and so forth, folks, the port is extremely important to this community. And any positive comments you can make would be very, very beneficial. Please don't hesitate to help the port with that. Those positive comments helped on the runway. Those positive comments will help on the port. Do you, uh, does any of the uh, panelists uh, have any future plans that we haven't already talked about? Something hidden away that we haven't uh, covered? Well, with that, uh, unless the, any of the panel members have a question for me, and I'm not honoring that, uh, any final questions of me, that, uh, that concludes our discussion here for this panel.